My name is Stacy Hicks. I'm a family doctor in Knoxville, Tennessee. The blessing of CMDA is uh, being part of an organization where there's fellowship with peer physicians who have a biblical worldview, a place to be able to wrestle with how do we be salt and light in a culture that's going in a different direction with uh, wisdom and compassion and encouragement. It's the wildest thing. It feels like I'm here with my people. I'm hearing other doctors and dentists and healthcare professionals that are struggling with issues of leadership, how to be mission-minded, and it's just been a, a real joy. I would join a CMDA to be with other like-minded professionals who can encourage you in the way you're trying to serve God. It's also an opportunity to pour into the next generation of younger professionals who are looking for encouragement and uh, mentoring as they try to, to grow in their faith. And there's so many opportunities, whether it's in uh, local outreach to our, our local medical student chapter or overseas mission trips. It's so many, there's so many opportunities to join, join arms with others who are like-minded and they're trying to serve God and be salt and light. Hi, this is Dr. Mike Chupp, and you are listening to CMDA Matters, the weekly podcast of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. Well, that was Dr. Stacy Hicks, who opened our episode this week, sharing a little bit about the ministry of CMDA and how much of a blessing it is to him as he seeks to be both salt and light in our world. I'm so thankful for CMDA members just like Dr. Hicks who understand the importance of the work the Lord is doing through CMDA in order to transform lives for Christ. If you listen in each week, you've probably heard me talking about the $300,000 matching gift that 13 CMDA champions provided in order to encourage all of us, me and you, to participate in CMDA's fiscal year-end giving campaign. Our goal of $750,000 by June 30th is critical to sustaining and achieving the goals that we all have for CMDA to effectively be bringing the hope and healing of Christ to our world through healthcare professionals who follow Jesus. It is amazing the life-changing work that God is doing in and through your CMDA. But without your generosity, friends, CMDA just can't continue the breadth of ministry that we feel God has asked us to do. You may not realize this, but your CMDA ministry relies greatly on the generosity of many to fuel the ministries to accomplish impactful work like physically and spiritually serving the poor through healthcare missions, reaching the next generation of healthcare professionals through campus and community ministries, equipping healthcare professionals with the necessary training and resources to share the gospel with their patients, tackling current and relevant legislation by challenging lawmakers toward ethical positions that align with our biblical worldview through CMDA's advocacy ministry, and there's so much more. As you can see, your CMDA is hard at work every day, and there is so much more to do. Your support today will help the CMDA ministries flourish. Will you consider a generous gift today and help claim all of that $300,000 matching gift and advance the work of your CMDA ministry? To give your gift today, just visit cmda.org match. Please let our stewardship team know if they can answer any questions or serve you in any way. You can call them by using 888-230-2637 or just email stewardship at cmda.org. My guest this week has all the right credentials to tackle a topic that I have seen written about and talked about so much in our medical literature and in the media right now. I specifically asked Dr. Sam Rod from MD Anderson in Houston to join me on CMDA Matters to talk about his ongoing research with cancer patients who've experienced long COVID symptoms. 
So keep listening in for my conversation with Dr. Rod, who's one of the leading experts, as well as physician inventors in the field of healthcare-related infections and infections in cancer worldwide. Well, today on CMDA Matters, I have an old friend back on the program. Dr. Isam Rod is uh, one of the leading experts and physician inventors in the field of healthcare-related infections and infections in cancer worldwide. And his focus on cancer, you'll understand, he's been the endowed distinguished professor of medicine. Previously, he chaired the University of Texas MD Anderson's Department of Infectious Diseases for 21 years. So those of you who know Houston and MD Anderson know that was a very prominent role. Dr. Rod has published over 500 scientific articles in high-impact peer-reviewed journals and over 40 book chapters and has more than 120 issued patents. But it doesn't stop there, friends. In 1989, Dr. Rod and several Christ-centered physicians, they met during a conference in our nation's capital and founded the Ministry of Home, which is Health Outreach to the Middle East. Home is a Christian organization that exists to offer physical and spiritual healing to people in need in the Middle East and has grown to support more than 20 clinics, mobile medical units, and hospitals in many Arab countries today. And currently, Home is actually in the process of establishing a teaching and medical mission training hospital in Cairo, Egypt. So, wow, Dr. Rod, it is an immense pleasure for me to welcome you back to CMDA Matters. Thank you so much for this introduction. Well, Sam, the World Health Organization recently declared, finally, we've been waiting for three years, an end to the COVID-19 pandemic. And it's certainly clear that in the United States that we have fewer and fewer conversations about the pandemic and about vaccines and about outpatient therapy. And some would say, oh, thank God, it's about time that all of this uh, discussion and dissension is gone. But I'd like for us to focus on an issue that you have been looking at and a few months ago published a paper with your colleagues on the topic of post-acute sequelae of COVID-19, or what is often referred to as long COVID. But let me first ask you a few general questions about COVID, if I might. How much COVID-19 are you seeing in Houston right now, and what are the demographics like and the severity of disease? In most of the uh, parts of the nation, uh, nationwide and actually worldwide, uh, there has been a major decline in the number of cases of COVID, and this is why the World Health Organization basically issued the uh, declaration that we are in the post-pandemic, uh, wide pandemic era. The positivity, the test positivity rate has gone be below 5% in most of the parts of the nation. There are some spots that are still high, uh, like you find it nationwide. We have a area in a southern parts of Texas which is still on the high side. There is a spot in Nebraska, uh, other small uh, areas. So one has to look at the where they are in order to assess. But in Houston, uh, we're r- right uh, below the sort of line which would define low versus medium. And we have done nationwide very well. And this is the contribution, I think, of the vaccines and the vaccine era. And it's a, a triumph to the medical community. When we were early in the camp- in the pandemic, uh, some of us were pessimistic because if you think of other viruses, RNA viruses, we had really a problem developing vaccines over tw- 20 to 25 years. Look at the uh, RSV, for example, a respiratory syncytial virus. Look at parainfluenza and all, all its strains, uh, which is really a killer in both children and also immune compromised patients. Uh, but we failed until now. We don't have antiviral therapy for them. Now the vaccine of RSV is moving in, but this is after 25 years of work. So really there has been milestone achievements in medical science. And really I believe that 
the good Lord has given us a an opportunity to really handle this very complicated virus. So from an infectious disease or immunology perspective, from the literature, especially ongoing randomized prospective trials, Dr. Rod, what's the ongoing efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccines, these mRNA vaccines for both adults and for children? I mean, we have data, which is a uh, we have uh, using the term the legal term preponderance of data through good prospective randomized study that the vaccines and particularly the mrna vaccines would decrease the risk of death and uh, progression of the disease so the if you get infected it would be a milder at the same time they would decrease the risk of having symptomatic covid again which is which is extremely important so really decreases the rate of covid and being symptomatic and also particularly in high risk patients would decrease the possibility of moving into being hospitalized or having a progressive critically ill status uh, with covid uh, and ultimately death so we have the data for that now in terms of the relative efficacy of the vaccines, the mRNA have been more efficacious. The Moderna vaccine has been shown to be slightly more effective, but not through head-to-head studies. In terms of rates, in terms of immunologic response, slightly better than the Pfizer. Most of us have taken the Pfizer because of the availability of the dose, and the Pfizer has been uh, quite effective in general. So the vaccine played an important role there. there are a lot of unanswered questions. For example, the studies with the vaccine, we have data, but it's not like prospective randomized. The vaccine versus the Omicron uh, variants uh, and the Omicron lineages now because we have the lineages that are coming out out there. So we have data, but it's not a prospective randomized data. But certainly it made a big difference based on the rates that we are seeing nationwide and worldwide, the decline in rates are directly proportional to the uh, wide distribution of the booster bivalent vaccine, which is, as you will know, the bivalent would really address the Omicron, not only just the general spike protein, but it also addresses or uh, provides immunity towards the Omicron uh, variant uh, lineage. So this is this is all has been very good news as far as the role of the vaccine versus the outcome of the disease. So I realize your patient population there at MD Anderson is focused on many cancer patients. I'm, I know you have other patients, of course, but in terms of general guidelines from the standard setting bodies, what are the current guidelines for adults and children in terms of the vaccine? How often to repeat, and who qualifies? So basically, immune compromised are, as you will know, a different risk group compared to the immune competent patient population. So in general, the immune competent should have received the uh, the regular vaccines, the two doses of the mRNA vaccine, and then a third booster that was out there, which is general. And it's important that they would receive the bivalent, uh, which is often uh, the fourth uh, booster at certain point when it was released. Uh, It was released basically on August, September, in the fall where most of the those who received the booster, especially in the medical community. So this is immune competent patient population. But if our patients haven't received the booster, first, if they haven't received the vaccine, it's important to, that they would be vaccinated. But if they haven't received the booster, it's very important to, to give them the bivalent uh, booster, uh, which is number four, basically. Now, how often should you repeat the booster? This is the big question. It's not answered yet. And if you really look at the literature and the guidelines, they're so iffy about it because we don't have hard data. How long would the person be immunogenic after receiving the bivalent booster versus the changing uh, variants of the of the Omicron? So in immune compromised, it's well established. They need to get another booster, which is would be number five potentially uh, within two months. So the quest is that they would receive the booster, let's say this is number four, the bivalent, and then they should receive the number five within two months. So we have it well worked out. And this is based on big studies looking at the immunogenic 
and immunologic reaction of immune compromised, especially patients with the uh, hematologic malignancy. Lymphopenia is a very important factor because, as you will know, the lymphocytes are they play, especially the B, B lymphocytes, in, in providing immune response. What about the immune competent, which is the majority of the patient population, unknown? So, you, you know, in some studies and some recommendations and guidelines, they say you, you receive it and you wait. Uh, in other situations where I know, especially in the medical uh, field, they say, no, with, after six months, you should get number five, uh, which is another bivalent, which I'm doing uh, personally. But there isn't hard data. But my own personal impression, it's going to become like influenza. Uh, in the immune competent patient population, you probably, we probably should receive once per year. And although the numbers are very low, but it's basically an endemic, uh, it's now endemic, it's not a pandemic, uh, but it's an endemic infection out there, and it should be treated like influenza. Well, anytime you bring up children, there's always a robust discussion, at least when it comes to vaccines and COVID. What are your pediatric colleagues there at MD Anderson recommending in terms of children? Because, boy, it's all over the map. And some of our members really have pushed back and written to me personally and say we should not be endorsing vaccines for COVID in children. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that fully. Uh, there is a viewpoint that in children, it's totally different ball game. So we divided the population into immune compromised and immune competent, but we're talking mainly about adults. Uh, in children, it's a different ball game, and there are multiple reasons for this. In general, and if you exclude the few low percentage of cases with MIS and the complicated form of COVID, uh, we have multiple factors in children why it has become a very much milder disease. In children, in general. COVID is milder. Then we have the Omicron, which is a milder form in children. And here, the big question is because it is a milder, like a common cold, and it's acting like the other endemic coronaviruses like we had, is it really wise to overwhelm children and give them every six months a booster? And they don't have risk factors like adults, basically cardiovascular problems and the and the rate and the uh, expression of the AC2 receptors where this virus binds is, is very low in, in children. So there's a big argument is the risk versus benefit ratio in the right direction. And I understand that, uh, but basically uh, I can say that uh, children uh, should not be given, if it's going to be given, should not be given more often than a year, uh, once per year period. Well, I want to segue to a topic that I had really hoped I could get you to talk about at a recent national convention, but uh, it's on me. I waited way too late to ask you to give a talk about long COVID and uh, what, what technically I think in the papers that have been written, including your papers, is post-acute sequelae of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or COVID or PASC. But I, I wanted um, to hear about long COVID because it's really kind of a topic that seems to be more commonly talked about now that the pandemic has been officially declared over. So uh, earlier this year, uh, you published a paper with your colleagues in February about the incidence and the impact of long COVID or PASC in cancer patients. Tell us about what you found in your population there at MD Anderson. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, long COVID is a one expression uh, of the complexity of COVID. And this is why COVID is more than just, I referred to the other coronaviruses. The acute COVID uh, is similar to the influenza in a way, uh, but the uh, but the complexity of COVID is is the fact that you can get uh, in many high risk patients uh, cases of long COVID or PASC as you uh, refer to it, uh, and this is part of it. The other one that we're seeing is the this rebound phenomena. Uh, you treat them with the oral antivirals and then they come back. This is different from long COVID, but they come back within two weeks, uh, usually the first ten days. 
uh, with the same symptoms and they're shedding the virus again, even immune competent patients. And then immune compromised patients, there is also the long-term shedding and sometimes the chronicity of the infection. So uh, this makes COVID really more complicated than just the regular virus that you can really overcome with the vaccine and, and gives another, another dimension of the chronicity of this virus, which is, which is somehow relatively unique compared to these RNA viruses, respiratory viruses that we're used to, to face. So there isn't a chronic RSV or chronic parainfluenza or chronic uh, parainfluenza and so forth. So the problem with long COVID is that in our study, for example, we, we followed up a huge number of cancer patients and we were actually surprised that 60% uh, of them had persistence of their symptoms up to 14 months uh, following the onset, which was really left a strong impression on us. Now, a caveat here is that, remember cancer patients, many of these symptoms that persisted and particularly fatigue and malaise are concurrent with their own cancer and chemotherapy, yes. uh, as you will know, Mike. So it's difficult to decipher. I mean, they were very sure on the interviews and, and follow up, uh, they were very sure that these symptoms they did not have with their with their cancer before and they occurred after that but the ones that were relatively disturbing but they were less often which were occurred in uh, more like 24 to around 32 percent of the cases were the cough uh, or the shortness of breath which were definitely related to the COVID. now the good news is that uh, majority of them uh, this long COVID would remain uh, including cancer patients in the first quarter, if you may, the first three months or up to a maximum of six months. Uh, very few would outlast and go into more than a year period. Majority would basically reverse. So, but what is irritating about it, it's uh, the burden, the, the symptom burden and the burden of disease would remain there on top of the cancer. If you look at the literature, we were also surprised to find and wide reports, including from the CBC, that the rate in the literature is between 10, as low as 10%, but it goes to 87%. Mm -hmm. And the average is, is, is there in the 40 or 50%. Now, there are some risk uh, patient population, which in our study, uh, it was very interesting to find, and this is talking about the other dimension where other practitioners uh, would be interested to find that those patients who get an acute infection are not the same like those who would really get an, a chronic infection, severe acute, uh, I have to qualify here. So a severe acute infection resulting in uh, uh, being put on the uh, intubated or having a severe pneumonia or critically ill uh, or multi-organ failure, these are not the patients who end up with a chronic, with a chronic infection, which is long COVID. Uh, which uh, let's call it long COVID or PASC rather than chronic. But uh, these are the ones not the same. And when looking at male versus female, females would end up with more uh, long COVID, whereas the men would end up with more the acute form, the severe acute form. Everybody goes through the acute form, but it seems. So this long COVID is more a residual inflammatory process that is continuing. It's not an infection which is continuing. It's a post-infection inflammation that is persisting. But those that get a severe infection and have a high expression of these uh, AC2 receptors, including, for example, hypertensive patients, these will get severe infection but will not get. Mm. So it balances out, uh, which is unfortunate, but uh, it's out there. So there is no treatment because this is an inflammatory process and it needs supportive care and not actually an infectious process that would require prolonged therapy or something of that sort. Uh, now we're looking at the role of the oral antivirals, including Paxlovid and Milnipravir, and what's their impact on long COVID, uh, which we're trying to find out. Would it be a fact that if you uh, basically suppress the uh, infection very early and you give it in this preemptive form, would it help to really prevent uh, or lower the rate of long COVID? And this is something we're trying, we're studying right now and, and looking into. Uh, and it seems from a certain patient population, we had 240 patients 
uh, with with Paxlovid and the uh, all of them are cancer with Paxlovid versus a uh, uh, a and it seems like the rates are lower than the 60% we reported before we had these oral antivirals, antivirals giving early uh, in the game. And the rates are more in the rather than 60% of cancer patients. We're talking about more in the range of 10 to 20%, uh, which is very promising, mm -hmm. which is very promising. There's something to keep in mind. Now, my recommendation to my colleagues uh, listening on this is that you really have to provide good supportive care, good attention, and just give them the hope that this is going to be reversed. This is not going to stay forever. Now, including the losing the taste and the smell, sensation, and so forth, this would ultimately reverse. Uh, it might take some time. But that encouragement, especially high-risk patients and elderly, uh, is of great value, I found, in dealing with our patients. So you, together with other studies, what and maybe the CDC have shown that that truly it's called long COVID, but in terms of chronic sequelae, like the loss of of taste and smell, that is extremely rare to be longer than a year or two is what I think I hear you say. Right. Yes. Yes. And for your patients, your cancer patients, I think the number was about 8% ended up being admitted for COVID-related problems. Yes. Was that most commonly respiratory in nature? Yes. I mean, this is the problem with the, and I think this is unique to cancer patients. They would develop an also, you know, a form of organizing pneumonia or a pulmonary fibrosis, and they will get more admitted. And, and you're right. This is more respiratory. Well, let's switch gears a little bit, uh, Dr. Rod. What are the CDC and the NIH and uh, maybe other world healthcare authorities doing that you're aware of in preparation for the next coronavirus pandemic that that at least I hear authorities saying will come someday? I'm not sure. But you see, this uh, it's very difficult to predict where is it going to come from. You see, it's, it's an open, like you're fighting on the Eastern Front and <laughs> you don't know if it's going to come from the Western Front or the Northern. Uh, so with these viruses, it's very difficult to predict what, who, what is the next virus and where is it going to come from? We all think of RNA viruses, the respiratory viruses, but what is the next target? And really, in a way, COVID and uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2 took us by relative surprise in the way of it was transmitted compared to SARS-CoV-1 and its potential. But I think we learned a lot of lessons that will make us more prepared, hopefully, that we are able to, uh, in a certain time period, uh, with coordinated effort, and I think the United States played, uh, the medical system we have in the United States played an important role. We're able to creatively come up with our effective vaccines. We're able to come up with the antivirals, and I'm, I'm again, pleasantly surprised and thankful that we have the oral antivirals, which we have, although some of them, like Paxlovid, have a lot of drug-drug uh, interactions, which make them, uh, they're useful, but they're difficult to kind of uh, reinforce in a high-risk patient population that are on so many other drugs. But still a major advancement, Monoprevir is a major advancement. The monoclonal antibodies were a big step. So medical science was able to be on the forefront in circumventing this. But what's the next virus? It's uh, We learned a lot of lessons and hopefully uh, in community also reinforcement. I hopefully we, we also would learn a lot of lessons from our mistakes and uh, being dogmatic about things and extremist in certain things. I think we overworked uh, uh, certain things and politicized uh, some, some measures, including the overuse of the mask and, uh, you know, not factoring things into the the life cycle of people and the economy and so forth, uh, and the other psychologic burdens that you put on people uh, with isolation and so on. So extreme measures uh, that are not really effectively, quantitatively would give major results should be avoided. Uh, hopefully this would be learned, but always you, you find extremism. And I'm, I'm proud of our community as Christian healthcare workers in a way of the being the moderators and the voice of, of reason and the balance, which I say uh, in many situations. 
and we should measure things appropriately and within within a certain context uh, rather than going to uh, one extreme or the other. Well, I'm reminded of a conversation I had at the local YMCA here in Bristol um, where I go frequently and a friend of mine who's a family physician, I encounter him occasionally, but about a year into the pandemic, I asked him, you know, what he thought about all the controversies regarding vaccines and outpatient therapy. And he said, I don't really want to talk about that, but I can't wait seven to 10 years from now to read in the textbooks what we got wrong and what we got right in terms of our understanding of COVID-19. And it would be nice to be able to take care of patients in the retrospectoscope, in the rearview mirror. But we don't have that opportunity. We have to do it real time. I want our listeners to know that I left something out of uh, Dr. Rod's bio as well. Are you still pastoring the, the largest Arab church in North America? Is that still happening? And how in the world do you find time? No, it's the largest actually in Texas. But uh, uh, yes, I'm still pastoring that. And I, I love it because I love the fact that we have a lot of young people and a lot of people in the medical field. Uh, there and this is the second generation that is taking over, uh, both in medical missions and being part of that community. Uh, so it's such a delight. That's now the the rewarding part in in that. I think we have something as as uh, Christ centered healthcare workers, and I discovered it in the uh, the deputy, my de- previous deputy actually uh, in the department used to remind me. He says one of your greatest accomplishment. Uh, during the uh, COVID pandemic is lifting the morale. Uh, You know, I applied the shepherding calling that we have and the the uh, Christ-like calling that we have into, I realized in the very beginning that uh, I have to be next to the troops, the people who are in the front line, whether they're the intensivist or the uh, our people, my faculty, who were really on call and we had the, the COVID section. So I used to come every weekend, whether I'm on call or not, and be right next to them and get them food. And I did that through the spirit of Christ. And this kind of a portrays the role we can do uh, with our patients, but also with our colleagues. Because the pandemic had its uh, something uh, that needs to be sometime discussed. Pandemic had such a demoralizing effect on the general patient population, but also on the medical community. And there was a tremendous panic in the very beginning, but it was so depressing, especially on the medical community and physicians and healthcare workers and being on the front line and all the time, everybody is asking them and even relatives and their community are calling us, calling us. Uh, So it was a tremendous pressure. I felt that one of the greatest uh, vaccines we can have is a vaccine against panic. (laughs) <laughs> uh, which which really comes from our Christian, basically, faith uh, in instilling that in, in the population. Well, the last piece of advice that I got from the president of World Gospel Mission, where I served as a missionary for a couple decades, he said, Mike, when it comes to leadership, whether it's a pastor or a physician leader, just remember, not every leader is a shepherd, but every shepherd is a leader. And you just mentioned about being a shepherd, and uh, you're a pastor shepherd, Uh, an infectious disease professor, an academic leader who's a shepherd as well, as we've just heard. So, And also a medical mission. So can you give us a brief update on the Cairo Medical Missions Institute that you guys have started there in Egypt? Yes, uh, we're we're ready to go. We have everything there. We have all the equipment. Uh, Praise the Lord. We have everything set to go. Uh, We're getting the final work on the license. And uh, the pharmacy is ready to open, and we we have great exciting thing. The other thing which was very helpful in Egypt and all around is the fact that we have mobile medical units, and we had one very effective in uh, in Egypt. But Egypt is so huge and big. There is Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt, so the mobile unit was going a huge mobile unit with two actually exam rooms and there is a little pharmacy and so on. So it was moving from between Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And now we're buying another one to be dedicated to Upper Egypt and another one on the more coastal line in the Lower Egypt. So this is some of the good news. The other good news is in Lebanon, because we're going to spend part of the mission trip in Lebanon. And there we're transforming the polyclinic into an ambulatory medical center. We have mobilized a good number of people to work with us. We will be going also in the mobile medical unit. We have excellent relationship with the 
Minister of Health, who really is so supportive and very thankful to him, and the American University of Beirut and the Lebanese American University, where now we're working out a joint effort for infectious disease prevention in that country, because they had a cholera and home helped tremendously in controlling cholera at the beginning of a cholera outbreak in that country. And basically now it's, it's gone, uh, but also COVID and the other respiratory infections. So things are going well, praise the Lord, all across. Now we're in 14 countries in the Middle East, which is in areas of the Middle East. The home played an important role in post-earthquake and we joined hand with Samaritan Purse in southern Turkey, but also we had work in the northern part of Syria where we have an active ministry, but everything has been good. I mean, uh, praise the Lord. Thank you so much for taking time out. I know you've got to, uh, to go rush to go see patients right now, but thanks for your time today to share with us about long COVID. Thank you so much. Have you downloaded the CMDA Go app? If you haven't, then now is your chance. In the CMDA Go app, you can set up your personal CMDA profile, renew your membership, make your dues payments, check out the latest news from CMDA, listen to CMDA Matters and other podcasts, access a variety of downloadable resources, interact with other members through the discussion forums, and join group chats. For more information, visit cmda.org slash app. And be sure to visit your device's app store to download it today. If you'd like to join the conversation with your colleagues about long COVID, I encourage you to check out the forums on the CMDA Go app that you just heard about. It's a great opportunity to share research, treatment options for long haul symptoms, and more with your CMDA colleagues. You can find that forum and many others in the CMDA Go app. You know, if my memory serves me correctly, this is the third time that Dr. Sam Rod has joined me as a guest on CMDA Matters. If you want to listen in to his previous interviews, which include information about the ministry he runs called HOME, which stands for Health Outreach to the Middle East, we've included the links in our show notes today. Home is an amazing network that God has established in the Middle East with more than 20 clinics in 14 Arab countries that provide medical care and education to the poor and the suffering in the Middle East. This ministry is breaking through the political and the religious and cultural barriers that exist in the area. And as a result, they're making way for a more fruitful and efficient ministry for God's kingdom. If you want more information about home, just visit home for him, H-O-M-E-F-O-R-H-I-M dot org. You briefly heard Dr. Rod share that home has been working to establish a teaching and medical training hospital in Cairo, Egypt. Education is clearly a key component of healthcare missions. And that's why one of our CMDA's mission outreach programs is Medical Education International, or MEI. If you haven't heard about MEI before, it is our short-term missions program that provides academic teaching as well as clinical training upon requests from governments, from healthcare professional training institutions and hospitals while building relationships with local colleagues and modeling the compassion, the care, and the love of Jesus Christ. MEI teams serve primarily in low and middle income countries, and most teams consist of anywhere from two to 10 fully trained healthcare professionals. Some of our MEI teams include medical students, residents, and fellows as well. If you'd like more information or to get involved, visit cmda.org slash MEI. Are you interested in short-term mission trips? Well, now is the time to start thinking about signing up for a global health outreach trip. GHO sends teams around the world to places like El Salvador, East Africa, India, the Pacific, Central Asia, Nicaragua, the Middle East, and many others. Through these trips, we disciple participants, 
grow national churches, share the gospel, and provide care to the poor and needy. Our teams minister in outpatient primary care medicine and dentistry, and in small and large hospitals to provide surgical services. If you are interested in using the skills and resources the Lord has entrusted to you, please visit cmda.org gho to learn more and find a trip that works in your schedule. Well, God willing, I'll be back next Thursday with a friend of mine, Dr. Steve Willing. He's a radiologist who spent 20 years in academic medicine, and he's a regular contributor to our blog called The Point. He recently released his first book entitled Superbia, The Perils of Pride and the Power of Humility. I asked Dr. Willing to join me to share about this, his first book. It's actually a project that he's been working on for nearly 20 years. As always, if you want to suggest a future guest for our podcast, you can email it to us at CMDA Matters, one word, at cmda.org. And if you like our podcast, be sure to give us a five-star rating and share us on your favorite social media platform. Before we go, let me share this testimony we received recently from a first-year medical student in North Carolina. I've really appreciated my CMDA small group and my time with the community of believers. My time at CMDA reorients my priorities, and it reminds me that my identity is in Christ, not my academic performance. What a great reminder, friends, in the midst of a busy season as we prepare for summer vacations, graduations, and welcoming in new healthcare students on campus. Just as Dr. Hicks reminded us at the beginning of this episode, And just as Dr. Rod reminded us while discussing his work with patients, our identity is in Christ, and we can represent Him faithfully while working in healthcare to bring the hope and healing of our Lord Jesus Christ to the world. That's what matters to CMDA, and CMDA matters. We'll see you next week, friends, God willing. This podcast has been a production of the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. The opinions expressed by guests on this podcast are not necessarily endorsed by the Christian Medical and Dental Associations. CMDA is a nonpartisan organization that does not endorse political parties or candidates for public office. The views expressed on this podcast reflect judgments regarding principles and values held by CMDA and its members and are not intended to imply endorsement of any political party or candidate.